Okay. We'll get back okay. to Jeanette's story in just a second. In the meantime, we want to take you now to uh, the MedStar Washington Hospital Center, where we're starting to get an update on the patients there. With four expected to be discharged eminently, um, actually probably two have already went home. Uh, the two patients that were listed in critical and serious condition have now been downgraded. Uh, one is in serious condition and the other is in fair condition. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Can you talk a little bit about can you explain a little bit what their injuries are exactly or, or just sort of generically speaking, you know, what scope damage would you do to a person? Yeah. Um, Everyone was evaluated for signs of respiratory distress. Um, most of the patients had some signs of smoke and soot in their mouth or on their face. They all got a laryng uh, laryngoscopy or a, uh, an examination of their voice box in the back of their throat to see if there was any evidence of inflammation. What we're initially most worried about is the airway becoming so edematous that they can't move air. Um, and that was the case for the one patient um, who will be here for a little bit longer. Um, in that case, the airway swells to the point where they can't exchange oxygen and you need to provide them with a breathing tube so that they can breathe. And what is the long-term prognosis for these patients? Well, it's hard to tell. Uh, most patients will be fine. They'll probably have some symptoms of cough, maybe some upper respiratory chest tightness, but most of that will leave them in 7 to 14 days. Now, of course, if a patient has a pre-existing respiratory problem, they might end up having symptoms that last longer, but that hasn't been the case with most of the patients that we've seen. Can you talk a little, and obviously this was a major incident, sounds horribly traumatic, can you talk a little bit about their mental state? How are they dealing? I think most of the patients are still a little um, shaken up from what happened there, um, but everyone uh, seemed to be uh, thankful to see their family and go home, the ones that we've sent home. So I think time will tell uh, um, how, how they'll do from actually being through the incident. God forbid there's another incident like this, but if there was, what is your best recommendation medically on surviving and doing the least damage to a body? when there's that level of smoke? Well, I think everyone that was involved got evaluated at one of the DC hospitals. That's probably the first step is to make sure you're evaluated by a physician and then go from there. No, but I mean, do you go low to the ground? Do you try to cover, I mean? Well, in a, it, we know most of the information that we have by um, our experience with patients who are exposed to smoke in a house fire. And of course, the instruction for those patients is to get low to the ground and to avoid um, the air that contains smoke and try to get outside as soon as possible to fresh air. And then, of course, EMS provides supplemental oxygen, which is what we do for everyone until we know what their evaluation is. And to what extent did any of the patients suffer burns? There were no burns. In a, in a case like this, in which um, people were instructed to actually stay inside the train cars, that would seem to go against the conventional wisdom to get out as soon as you can. Do yeah. you know anything about that? I'm not, I'm not familiar with any of the instructions they were given. Um, I know you guys train a lot for, for incidents where there's going to be a lot of injured, a lot of casualties, that sort of thing. Um, what was the atmosphere like at the hospital when you, when you heard about this incident and then when everybody was coming? We were notified by the DC Emergency Healthcare Coalition pretty early, and we had active communication with DC Fire and EMS during the whole incident. So we were prepared. Uh, we had approximately, I would say, almost 20 physicians ready to go. Some of those were trainees, but we had uh, faculty on staff as well. Um, and we uh, we set up some triage stations and got people into categories based on whether or not they needed a more formal evaluation or not. Well, what's the first thing you do when you see a patient that's had that kind of smoke? Uh, this, uh, yeah, probably just to remain calm and continue their evaluation, they need vital signs, oxygen, and, and go stepwise through um, their physical exam until you identify something that needs further workup. Obviously, there, there are many patients, and I know it's, it's case by case, but did you get any indication of how long they all were breathing in this smoke, and, and how much would that exacerbate their conditions, how long they were in there? Well, exposure time would probably make the condition worse. It was hard to gauge on a patient-by-patient -patient basis who was in longer and who got out first. Um, but they were all in for a, a, a long enough amount of time that they could have had... It's, yeah, it's hard to tell. Uh, some patients had smoke and soot on their face, but whether that was just a lot of smoke in a short time or slightly less in a longer time, it's hard to tease that out. Were there any situations where you looked at patients the same So, I was like, oh! And then VALs in a news conference, so now I'm going to... Yeah, I think they all got, uh, the patients that we received all got to be evaluated um, early enough. Uh, the one patient that did have some vocal cord edema, um, if it would have lasted much longer, he would have had some more issues to be able to breathe. So we got everyone in a timely manner. Was he the one that was initially um, conditioned as critical? Correct. And, and is there anything you can 
compare this to uh, in terms of what kind of smoke inhalation or injuries would it be comparable to some sort of a, a building fire or anything you, that it would remind you of or something you've seen in the past? Yeah, I mean, we see smoke inhalation quite frequently in patients who suffer from burns um, that are in a house or a closed space for a long period of time. Um, so that's where most of our experience comes from this. Yeah. And how was this different from someone you would see coming from a house fire? Uh, it didn't appear that these patients had suffered the same thermal insult. So they didn't have facial swelling or burns on their face or singed hair, or things like that, that we use as markers to determine how severe someone's uh, upper airway could have been burned. So. Is there any, I know you said seven to 14 days for a lot of these folks and they should be back to normal and close to it. Is there any uh, clinical research or any evidence that demonstrates any long-term impact there are long-term impacts. Whether or not we understand exactly the mechanism for why some people suffer from asthmatic-like um, sequelae from being in a smoke inhalation incident and others don't, I don't know that we have the answer to that right away. By and large, it's treated um, with uh, bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory medication just like you would other uh, reactive airway diseases. And is that sort of why you said time will tell? I mean, it is one of these things where essentially it's may not be known for some time. Correct. This, um, there's different kinds of smoke that have different particles in them. Mm -hmm. This was apparently caused by an electrical shortage of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an electrically based fire. Does that, can you tell us about how that would be different from a different kind of fire, let's say a wood fire or a coal fire? Well, I think that's, so it's what burns, not how it starts think, burning. Yeah. So it all depends on what kind of, con um, uh, fuel is there for the fire to, to feed off of. So um, certain synthetics give off different types of chemicals that we worry about and um, we didn't have any any evidence of that on, on patients who needed blood work um, drawn that that was an issue. Can I ask, there were a lot of people yesterday who their adrenaline was going after getting off this train and they just wanted to get to their, they just wanted to get home. Mm -hmm. What are some symptoms that uh, you would advise someone to seek care if they're still feeling it the day after as far as smoke inhalation goes? Um, shortness of breath, cough, chest tightness, um, and then major symptoms like lethargy and not feeling like you have energy, things like that. We, we saw a lot of people throwing out, like getting sick right. outside, is that, that's normal? It could be. How were these patients treated when they got to the hospital? What was sort of explained um, what you guys did with them? Uh, well, we it started with just asking the patients if they were having any problems breathing or if they were having any symptoms that were concerning for upper respiratory issue. And then that was our first triage point. And then everyone got vital signs. Everyone got their lungs auscultated. Some people got chest x-rays. Lab values were, were drawn. And, and other patients that had more concerning evidence of inhalation injury got direct laryngoscopy, where we actually numb the throat and take a, a look at the vocal cords and the glottis to see if there's any swelling or signs of inflammation. To what extent was this a worst case scenario, to have them enveloped in smoke and unable to get away from the smoke for an extended period of time? To what extent? Yeah. Well, all the patients that we've treated are seemingly got out in time. I don't know, I, I haven't treated any of the other patients and actually don't really have a lot of information about what other hospitals got, um, but uh, it seems like they did get out in time and uh, they are, they're doing okay. Can you put a time frame on, is it five minutes in a condition like that or 10 minutes, do you have a ballpark? It's hard to tell and in, in most of the data that has been done in research is also factoring in heat and and uh, to simulate what someone would be exposed to in say a house fire. So it's really hard to tell um, because as people have mentioned here, it depends on what was burning, how hot it was, how long they were there, how close they were to the source. And I don't know that we have enough data to really speculate on that. For this. On a personal note, what's it like to be a doctor treating a mass casualty and will MedStar handle this any differently? Did you learn something? I think we've learned a lot in the past about how to um, organize ourselves during a mass casualty incident. We practice, we have drills, um, uh, and I, I think that um, everything ran very smoothly last night. We had everyone ready to go and uh, patients got to their beds and to the floors very quickly. So I think that um, we are still 
learning space management and things like that, which you always do depending on how many patients you have. But I think that everything went very smoothly last night. Your personal takeaway from this? Um, my personal take? Or just, you know, you, your, your emotion related to this incident. Oh, it was just, it was very awling to see how shaken up everyone was. So we have to always make sure that you're being sensitive to that when you're trying to evaluate a large group of people. Sometimes you lose a little bit of the autonomy that you would have if you were the only person that walked into the door. So try our best to keep everyone uh, as experienced as good as possible. Can you describe that sort of sense of being shaken up? Can you, I mean, what is it that you saw? What were they saying to you? Well, everyone was on their way home from work or wherever. You could tell that their life had just kind of been put on pause for a little bit and then they geographically were moved to a different area so everyone I think was just kind of stoic and trying to take as much in as they could while worrying about whether or not they felt like they had symptoms or not so um, just in terms of the six patients who are going to be released uh, two have been upgraded mm -hmm. has the, like, the progress been better quicker than you anticipated no, I, the intention for the patients that were being released today was just to observe, observe them. So that was their treatment. And, and once, once you get out of a certain window of time and you don't have to worry about upper airway issues, then it's more safe to let patients go. So that was the expected plan for those patients. And what about the other two? The other two are on track and, and uh, everything that's happening with them is pretty much expected at this point. Any other questions? The age ranges of, of the people that you I do not. What time today do you expect the board to be discharged? Well, I made rounds at 11 o'clock, so it's all just in the details now. Their ride, their paperwork, things like that. So for all I know, they all could be home. So. Thank you okay, thank you very much. Dr. Jeffrey Shupp, who is the uh, head of the Burn Research Program at the MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and he's also been in charge, apparently, of the, uh, the treatment of those patients who were taken yesterday to the Washington Hospital Center. And in fact, uh, there were a considerable number of them. And you heard that just about all of them who'd been held overnight for observation have now been discharged and sent home. Apparently, Dr. Shep said doing just fine. But there were those two patients, uh, one of whom was in critical condition, the other in serious condition. And Dr. Shep said both of them are improving, that their conditions have been upgraded. And he said their progress and prognosis uh, is both good, uh, so we can take uh, some, some comfort in that, the uh, two most seriously injured of those patients. Interesting, too, the doctor said, I, uh, or what I found interesting, no burns uh, did they see among any of the patients who had been admitted, and that's sort of consistent with what we've been hearing. All of the problems, apparently, were with what they had inhaled, that smoke, uh, and whatever the particulate matter was that was in that smoke causing most of the problems. And he said if anyone had gone home and who didn't get medical treatment yesterday but who has shortness of breath, maybe tightness in the chest, uh, just a general feeling of malaise and not feeling particularly good, probably ought to get to the family physician and tell them what happened so that they can be evaluated. Live coverage for you here on News Channel 8. We'll have a lot of it throughout this afternoon, so we want to let you know about that. Our coverage will continue all throughout the afternoon and online as well. If you go to news8.net, we'll bring you the developments as they materialize. And we'll also keep a very close eye for you on the afternoon commute.